Amen, 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 amen. You may be seated. Amen. Glad to see everybody tonight. My wife sends her love. Uh, she is with uh, our oldest two. Uh, tonight is uh, Jeff City's open house for the high school. And so they're meeting teachers and signing up for groups and clubs and all that good stuff. And so that's where they're at. So me and Josiah came to church. Amen. And, um, and uh, it was quite a challenge driving. Um, but uh, thank God he, uh, he helped us get here. Amen. Amen. And so um, also wanted to start off by just thanking everybody, you know, your, um, your love, your support. Um, just uh, rallying around us during this time. It's just been awesome, and so many of you have blessed us with either money or gift cards or whatever to help us get some food for taking a load off my wife's shoulders, you know, trying to work a full-time job, be my nurse, be a mother, and cook meals has, has been a challenge, and so it's just been a blessing. So for everybody that's given, thank you so much. It's been such a blessing to us and, um, and going to be a blessing as uh, we today we closed on the house, praise God, got the keys, amen, and uh, all glory to God for that, and my wife informed me that she has cooked her last meal in that house, and so uh, she is trying to pack up the kitchen and all that good stuff, and so it's just been a blessing, and um, you know, you guys are such a wonderful spiritual family, and we just love you guys so much, so thank you for all of you that have, have given either through, you know, money or gift cards or uh, what have you. So thank you so much. And to all the guys that have uh, signed up and ladies to signed up to help us out on Saturday. Thank you in advance. My doctor forbade me to lift a thing. So the only thing I'm lifting on Saturday is a cup of coffee and maybe a donut. We'll see what happens. Um, but we're looking forward to it. We went over today and walked through it and uh, just overwhelmed by the goodness of God. And um, you know, as a husband and a father, to see my wife gleam from ear to ear and excited, and uh, she wouldn't hardly look at much outside the kitchen, um, just, you know, excited. And then we took the kids over, and, and uh, she looked like she was the realtor. She was giving the tour of the house to the children, and, um, and it was so really so cool. But the, the thing that touched me is um, if you go out the back, uh, there's a glass door, and you go out the back to a covered patio, so rain sleet, snow, shine. I can cook, praise God. Uh, but then you go out the patio and out the patio, it's a covered patio. And then I got, I, it's the little things in life that are like, you know, that get you sometimes, right? So we were going through the drawers and I saw this little remote. And I was like, I don't even know what this goes to, but I saw a couple of icons on it. And I turned around, I'm like, I just got a feeling. And there's a ceiling fan in the, in the patio area. And it's a remote for the fan. I was like, oh, you better shut up, man. That's so cool, <laughs> right? So uh, so just, you know, so we go out, and, and I, I said, kids, let's go check out the yard. So they go out in the yard, and as soon as they got out in the yard, they just, all three of them. Now, these are not seven and eight-year-old children. This is 17, 15, and 13. And they just ran buck wild all over the yard. And uh, tears came to my eyes just as a father to see such joy and God just spoke to me in that moment, and he said, how do you think I feel when you rejoice in the things that I've done for you? And uh, so I just want to encourage you with that. I mean, I mean, that's the God that we serve. Amen? Amen. And so I just, it's just really, really exciting. My wife is just kind of saying there like, yeah, burn off that energy. Go ahead. Get tired. <laughs> you know? So it's just really, really looking forward to, uh, you know, get moved in this weekend and then settling in next week. And so thank you to all of you. You've just been so wonderful to us. And uh, we couldn't be more excited to be your pastors. Amen? All right, grab your Bible tonight. We're going to look at um, the Word tonight. Um, for those of you that might be new for us, uh, we've been talking about tuning into God's voice or how to hear the voice of God, or you could even say how to distinguish the voice of God, how to make sure what we're hearing in our spirit or in our ear sometimes is coming from the Lord and not ourselves or any other thing, right? How, how to decipher the difference between a dream that comes from God and bad pizza. Amen? And so uh, that's what we're talking about. So tonight, in the last couple weeks, we've talked about how to hear God when we're searching the scriptures and then how to hear God while we're worshiping because God will speak during those seasons. Um, but I also want to talk about that there is an importance that God places on valuing or what I call honoring God's voice. And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight, session six, giving honor to his voice. 
Um, and because, quite frankly, what you make room for or what you give honor to, God will increase in your life. I'm going to say it again. What you give honor to, God will increase in your life. If you take something for granted, God will not increase it. If you assume something, God will not increase it. But when you give honor to something, God increases the thing you give honor to. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> so, so that's what we're going to talk about. Like, How can we practically, step by step, give value and give honor to God's voice in our lives so that his voice in our lives increases more and more. Amen? So let's look at Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 13. Jeremiah 29 and verse 13. The word of God says, You shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all of your heart. That's what it means to give honor or to value God's voice. The Bible says that if we'll seek him, we'll find him. He's not the type of God that is so pervertedly twisted that would want you to pursue him and him refuse to be found. He wants to be found by you. Uh, last week we talked about that, that the word says, I will meet with you and speak to you. And so those are the encounters that we're talking about. And the Bible says that if you'll just search for him, he will be found. Uh, I want to start off with this section. It's called learning, learning to value his voice. Learning to value his voice. There's four things about learning to value God's voice that I want you to see. Number one, hear me now, because you're going to have to remind yourself of this truth. Number one, it takes time. It takes time to learn how to value the voice of God. In other words, if you just got saved Sunday, you're not going to be a master in this by Wednesday. It takes time. And can I tell you that beyond it taking time, it takes years. I'm telling you, it takes years. And even after years, you can still miss it. Okay, so it takes time. I say that because some of you, I don't want you getting under condemnation if, you, if you're trying and trying and trying and still aren't getting it. It takes time. Look at somebody and say, give yourself some grace. <laughs> give yourself some grace. Number two, not only does it take time, but it happens through numerous encounters. What happens when you encounter something good? Let's not, we're not talking about spiritual things. Let's, I mean, has anybody gone to a restaurant and it was a good encounter, right? Have you ever been on a date and it was a good encounter? You enjoyed it. But what happens if the encounter is really, 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 really good? You, you want more, right? Like, so if you go on a horrible date, you're like one and done, right? But if you go on a really, 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 really good date, like everything about it was just wonderful, what does it make you want to do? Right? Stalk them. No, it makes you want it makes you want to have another encounter with that person, right? I read the the greatest meme the other day. It says, I knew from the very first time that I saw you, and the very first time that we spoke, that I wanted to live the rest of my life without you. How many have had an encounter like that? <laughs> it's like from the first time you opened your mouth, I knew I didn't ever want to see you again for the rest of my life. Amen. But on the flip side of that, how many have had the opposite encounters? Like, man, as soon man, it's just, just connecting with somebody, you're like, man, I just I want you in my life for the rest of my life, right? And so, um, not just in a romantic sense, but that can be in a pot, that could be in business, it can be in a neighborhood, it can be in literally anything, okay? And so understanding that through numerous encounters with God, it will create and increase your ability to then place value on his voice, right? Because the more you encounter him, the more you will desire to encounter him, and that desire will move you to build value in those encounters. Does that make sense? Number three, value is built through accuracy. So, if you say God spoke to you and you obey what he says, but it wasn't him, 
that is not an, an accurate encounter, is it? And if you, you I'm just, you're convinced you heard God, you spoke what you heard, and somebody said, you are so off in left field, man, like what is wrong with you? It is not going to move you to say, God, speak to me again, is it? But what happens if God speaks to you? And you're not convinced it was God, but you kind of think maybe sort of it was God. And you stepped out in faith and said what you heard, and then somebody got a miracle or a breakthrough as a result. That is called accuracy, right? Even if there's no confidence, it was still accurate. What does that accuracy do to you? Tell me again, Jesus. Tell me again. I want something else, right? I remember I was a teenager and I stood before somebody and God said, tell them this. And I knew, and I, I'm, I'm like, man, I really think that's God. So I told them and they just wept and shook. And there was this crazy encounter with the Holy Spirit. And I went, who else? Who else? What, what else are we going to do tonight, God? Right? Because the accuracy creates a desire for you to build an importance on those encounters. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Number four, the process of identifying his voice creates honor. So the more you do it, the more you encounter it, and it's not, watch this, it's not the encounter, it's the process of getting to the encounter that will cause you to build value because you want to go through the process again. Like that was amazing. God, help me to live a life that honors you in and, and I want to, God wants to hear you say, I want to hear you speak to me. I want your mouth to open and my ears to receive it because, because something powerful has taken place, right? Not because we have the motive of we want to be somebody that is known who hears God, but because we want the encounter of hearing God and the, the thought that God would even speak to somebody like me, right? But he will. There isn't anybody in here God won't talk to right? Are we busy and too busy to hear him? Or can we slow down, build value in the process so that we can hear his voice? Amen? Amen. So these things are vitally important. So let's talk about this. Go to Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 3. Jeremiah 33 and verse 3. Jeremiah 33 and verse 3 says, Call to me, and I will answer you. Watch this now. Here's the secret. And I will show you great and mighty things which you do not know. I want to say it like this. Call to me, and I will answer you, and I will show you great and mighty things which you cannot know. Right? Because that's the process of God speaking to you. Right? Call to me. Pray to me. Seek me, pursue me, and I will answer you. There's no room for debate there, is there? You call to me, I'll answer, right? God's not sending you to voicemail. God's not hanging up, right? He's not ghosting you. God will answer if you call to him. And he said, and I will show you things which you do not know, you cannot know, you cannot perceive, but then you'll begin to know them and understand them when you call to me and I answer you. So, so I, I've titled this section, When God Wants to Do Something. The reality is God has a desire to speak to you and for you to hear him. And when God wants to do something, there is a process. Watch this now. Number one, when God wants to do something, the first thing he does is he makes an announcement. You know, how many, how many ra that raised children or are currently raising children had a child or currently have a child that announces what they're going to do every single time without fail? Y'all know I got more than one that does that, and we're not talking about Jillian. Y'all know my boys are like that. I mean constantly. Uh, and Josiah more than Judah, you know? Like, Judah has, now that he's getting a little bit older, he doesn't do it as much, man, when he was younger. Dear Lord, you know, there was no guessing as to what he was up to, which is good, because, man, if you can't find him, you get worried about what's happening, right? And so Josiah, even to this day, he'll make an announcement. It was uh, Monday. I was, I was off Monday. I was in, in the house just, just trying to stay off my foot and rest, and, and I'm sitting on the couch, and Josiah was over on the computer, 
and uh, was there for a long time, you know, doing, playing games, watching videos, doing whatever it is that he was doing. And after a while, he just stopped, rolled back the chair, looked at me and said, I'm getting a drink. Okay. It's in the kitchen. Okay. Goes back, resumes what he was doing. He does this all the time. Play, playing, doing whatever he's doing. Well, stop. I'm going to the bathroom, okay? How many have a child or had a child like that and you understand my plight? Like literally, like not, they can't do anything, okay? I would be sitting there. Dad, what time is mom coming home? Like 10 minutes. I'm taking a shower, okay? And, and so the reality is God will make an announcement about what it is he desires to do. This is what we call prophecy. It is God announcing his intent. Look at this. When God makes an announcement, he does this, number one, through dreams, number two, through visions, number three, through prophetic words, or number four, through specific passages of Scripture. How many have witnessed this in your own life? God will literally make an announcement to you about his desire of what he's going to do in your life to give you the opportunity to come into agreement with what it is that he wants to do, okay? So when you have a dream, when you have a vision, when you have a prophetic word given to you, when something leaps off the pages of the Bible to you, that is not you just having a Pentecostal moment, okay? That is God making an announcement, making an announcement. And and they'll come, and, and, and let me tell you, these dreams and visions and prophetic, I mean, nine times out of ten, it's not even something you're expecting. It just it takes you by surprise. It's like, whoa, where'd that come from, right? And this is what I want you to say. You'll never have a dream or a vision from God that is not backed up by Scripture, okay? It's not going to be unbiblical. There will be a verse in the Bible that supports the dream or the vision because God's spoken word, his supernatural moving, is grounded in his written word. They'll never disagree with one another, okay? And so when this happens, it's just simply God saying, this is what I'm gonna do in your life. I remember I was 12 years old, and let me tell you, I didn't have dreams of pastoring. I didn't have dreams of even speaking to people. I had sports dreams. I had, I had goals. I had things I've talked to you about that before, things I wanted to do. We were in Canada during summer vacation, my dad was preaching a revival. The pastor said, uh, a, a prophet is in town and she would like to pray for your family. Could you come to my house? We go to his house. I'm 12 years old. You think I want to sit down and drink a cup of coffee and talk to a prophet? No, absolutely not. I'm playing with the pastor's kids and, and, and this, this prophetess stopped and she said, where's your son? He said, I didn't tell you I had a son. She said, he's in the house. Where is he? Well, he's in the basement playing. Call him. So they call, you know, come up here. You know, I'm 12. Why? <laughs> Just get up here. So I go upstairs and I sit down on the couch and I see this lady. I've never seen her before in my life. And my father says, this is prophetess so-and-so. She's asked to pray for you. I grew up in a preacher's house. This is nothing new. I said, sure. And then she said, sit at my feet. I thought, that's weird. I don't know you, right? <laughs> but you know what I did? I sat at her feet, and she began to shake, and she closed her eyes, and she began to pray in the spirit with violence. And I was scared to move. But you know what? Do you think I lifted my hands and closed my eyes? Brother, you better believe I did not. I kept my eyes on that woman because I didn't know what was going on. And then she looked at me, and she said, close your eyes and lift your hands, and so I did. And she began to prophesy. I'm, I'm telling you, gave me a word of wisdom that I'm now walking out. She said, she said, I mean, just, I'm talking about, how many in here, you know, I, I have, I, we have a guy in our, I'm not going to call his name because I don't want to embarrass him. We have a guy, a guy in our church, and he tells me all the time, he goes, Pastor Tim, I'm so sick and tired of you reading my email. <laughs> you know, and I, and so, you know, we laugh at that, but. 
how many of those means like somebody read my mail? I mean, somebody, somebody was all up in my kitchen sink. I mean, somebody knew exactly what was going on in my life. And she said, you have said to me, and I suddenly I knew she wasn't even talking to me. It was God speaking through her. You have said to me what you will do with your life, but this day I'm letting you know what I will do with your life. You have dreams of basketball. You have dreams of this. You have dreams. And she began to list every single thing that was in my heart to do that I hadn't even hardly even told my parents about. And she said, but I am setting you apart this day. And the anointing you have seen in your parents, I am giving you this day a double portion. And I shook because I had seen my mother lay hands on demon-possessed people, and they immediately get delivered. Scared the life right out of me. I'd seen my father lay hands on people in wheelchairs, and they walk. Lay hands on people that are deaf and blind and mute, and immediately they'd get healed. I saw people on crutches and braces with, with uh, incurable diseases. Just boom, 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 boom. And she said, in everything you've witnessed in your parents, I will do more than double if you'll just say yes. Was it happening? No. It was what? An announcement of what God wanted to do in my life. You know? And now we're starting to see some things that's like, wow. You know? My mother just told me, she said, I, she said, and it was so funny the way God uses my mom because, you know, uh, and, 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 I, and I don't say this for you to disagree with me or say, oh, no, pastor, it was fine, it was good, or whatever. But I left Sunday thinking, man, and I'll be honest with you, how many felt the anointing Sunday? Okay? I didn't feel a drop. Not a drop Sunday. People, people have already given me testimonies of what God did in their life Sunday. I didn't feel a drop. Not a drop. And I went home and I said, to my wife, I'm like, well, I just hope that wasn't a waste of a Sunday. She goes, oh, stop it. And I said, I'm serious. I said, I don't feel a drop of the anointing. She said, you were anointed. My, wife, my mother called me less than 10 minutes later. She goes, I don't know what it is you stepped into. She said, but I shook and trembled under the power of God while you were preaching. She said, something came through my phone. And I was like, well, praise God, you can be anointed when you don't feel anointed. Come on. I'm not saying that about me. I'm saying that about you. You can be anointed even when you don't feel anointed. And it's, it's part because, I've, I, and I know this, I've stepped into a season that God spoke to me 32 years ago. And now we're beginning to bear the fruit of that, and it's just wonderful. Amen? So, number one, he makes an announcement. When God wants to do something, number two, he awaits our agreement. See, it didn't matter everything that God wanted to do in my life if I was determined to pursue a career in sports. I had to agree with what he said over my life. Agreement is the earnest reception of his words. The earnest reception of his words. To come into complete obedience with faith and expectation. So when God makes an announcement in your life, it is not, just because God speaks it over you does not mean it will come to pass. Because God's intentions, God's announcement must be met with your yes. And when you say yes to it, then God begins to unfold it and bring it to pass. So, the question then is, will we agree with the things that he has said over our lives? Because God might give you a dream tonight that will blow your mind away, and, but then you have the option to say yes or no. To say, so be it. Watch this. An angel appeared unto Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace. Highly favored. Right? And the angel told Mary what God desired to do to make her bear forth a son, even though she was a virgin, right? And he would be the Lamb of God, right? That would take away the sins of the world. And Mary then had the option to say yes or no. Because she said, be it unto me according to your word, then God could do it. At that point, it was nothing but an announcement. Your agreement 
is the key ingredient to fulfillment. I'm going to say it again. Your agreement is the key ingredient to fulfillment of all of the intentions and the promises of God that he wants to do in your life. You've just got to, you've just got to say yes. I was sitting in Bible college, and I was thinking one day, and I said, God, how did I land here? I thought, man, I thought I was the, you know, I had an awful mindset. I thought I was going to be the next big thing in the NBA. I did. I did. All my friends called me White Jordan. I'm not, I'm not joking. That was my nickname, which is weird because I didn't stick out my tongue and I didn't dunk. But anyway, I don't know. I can't explain it. But that's what, and I, I just thought that was my path. And then I'm sitting in Bible college, nowhere near a basketball. I was in a Bible college, didn't even have a basketball team. And I said, God, how did I land here to pursue ministry when everything in me wanted to pursue a career in sports? And he, I'm, I'm in, just so sweetly, he whispered in my ear, he said, because you said yes. Because you said yes. And for the first time at that point in 19 years of life, it had finally dawned on me. It hit me like a freight train. I had the power to say no. I could have rejected God's will. I still would have been saved, but I wouldn't have fulfilled my purpose. And chances are he would have made sure I had a career-ending injury and would have ended up in Bible college anyway. <laughs> what are you going to do? Okay, so... That's why, this is what I'm, this is why we're talking about this. Because understanding that your agreement carries power in it. Because your agreement says, God, what you said, I receive it, now let's do it. Number three, the third thing when God wants to do something is he takes care of the rest. This is the thing. The thing God gives you, the thing God speaks to you, it's not your responsibility to bring it to pass. God will do it. It is your responsibility to say yes. It's your responsibility to say yes. You know, my sister-in-law couldn't even spend the night at her friend's house without coming home in the middle of the night because she would get homesick. And sometime between high school and college, God spoke to her and gave her a dream and a vision to become a missionary in West Africa. But guess what? God's intention for her had to be met with her, yes, I'll go. And she went. But she had the opportunity to say no. Do you, I'm going I'm to show you scripture on this. Do you remember when the Apostle Paul says that I'm going over to this place? And then he got a vision of a Macedonian man and said, come and help us. Paul then said yes to one and no to the other. Your agreement carries power to fulfillment. And the reality is, if God's promised you something, if he spoke to you something, if he's given you a dream or a vision over something, it's not on you to make sure it comes to pass. It's on you to come into agreement with it. Amen? That takes the pressure off of us, right? When I realize results are in the hands of the Lord and there isn't anything I can do to bring the result, right? Nobody gets saved because of you. Nobody gets healed because of you. Nobody gets delivered because of you. They get saved, healed, and delivered because of God and God's power, right? But your obedience is a key ingredient. Amen? Amen. Now let's look at this. How can we honor his voice? How can we honor his voice in your life? Number one, to honor his voice, I must train myself to listen. Okay, I'm going to repeat that. I must train myself to listen. This is found in your prayer life. You've got to train yourself to listen to the voice of God, which means your prayer life cannot just be you talking. I'm going to tell you something. There's not a lot of preachers that would tell you. It is just as important that you are silent in the presence of God than that you talk in the presence of God. Train yourself to listen. Number two, 
you must not wait, watch this, for emergency situations. If to value the voice of God, I cannot wait for an emergency situation to then listen for the voice of God. Because that's what we all do. Oh, God, if I don't hear from you today, this whole thing's going belly up. I'm, I'm going to fail if I, you know, emergency situations, incurable diseases, financial hardship, child with really, really just struggling or addiction or whatever, some major issue, or maybe it's a major life change, a major life decision, then, then we say, God, I, you've got to speak to me. i got to know what to do. Train yourself to not wait for those moments and ask God to speak to you on the daily. Every single day. Now, please, folks, let's not get weird. Right? Don't be standing in your closet. God, I'm not getting dressed till you tell me what shirt to wear. That's not what I'm talking about. But maybe, 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 and I just got a testimony on this recently, maybe you, did, you do need to ask God where he would like for you to go for lunch or dinner if you're going out instead of you just going where your flesh wants. Because maybe there's an encounter with an employee that God needs you positioned in a certain place at a certain time. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, don't do this, God. Are you telling me to go to the donut shop right now? I feel like you're telling me. Lord, I, you know what? Don't even say nothing, Lord. I hear you. Okay? That's not what we're talking about. Okay? Don't say, oh, God, here's my remote. Which television program do you want me to watch tonight? Let's not get weird. But on, there are daily decisions that you need to make. What does the Bible say? Do not say, I will do this or I will do that, but rather say, if the Lord wills. Then we can make plans to do this or that, but the Bible says that man makes plans, but the Lord orders his steps, okay? So don't wait for the big stuff. Ask God to speak to you on the daily, on the daily, amen? Number three, Seek to hear from him consistently, consistently, consistently. You know, like it's, it's not goofy or weird to say, you know what, Lord, uh, I'm going to such and such. Which way do you want me to go? Which way do you want me to go? I've, I've done that more times than I can even tell you about. Which way do you want me to go? And you know what? He'll say, go this way, and then it will come out that if I had gone the other way, I would have gone in a head-on collision. Don't take the voice of God. This is how you build value. Don't wait for the big stuff. Train yourself to listen and listen consistently. Consistently. On the daily. On the daily, right? So this is not standing in, in, in Jamoli's saying, all right, Lord, we go in chocolate or vanilla today. What are we doing? Okay, that's not what we're talking about. But there are daily decisions that you can make that you need to make with the voice of the Lord. And not and stop just doing stuff, as my father would say, willy nilly. Just doing it for the sake of doing it. Get the will of God flowing in your life, amen. Number four, make His voice a priority. Make His voice a priority. Don't ever live your life saying, "Well, I've done everything else I can. I guess I'll pray." Pray first. Pray first. Make it a priority. Number five. Learn to recognize how he speaks to you. Because I could line up five of you. Raise your hand if you know beyond the shadow of doubt the voice of God. You know, you know, you know the voice of God. You don't have to learn it. You know it. Okay? I'm one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay? So me plus six. That can say beyond the shadow of a doubt. I know the voice of God. I don't have to learn the voice of God. I know the voice of God. I can tell you right now, if we had the time, we could go and hear from all of us, and how we hear God varies from person to person to person. Now, watch this. Now, I'm going to show you something. Watch this. So those six of you, five of you, however many it was now, those six of you that knows the voice of God beyond the shadow of a doubt, raise your hand again. Now, 
put your hand down if he speaks to you the same way every single time. Every single time. Put your hand down if he speaks to you the same way every single time. Okay? No, he doesn't. And that's the thing. And it takes time. Now, some of you, it will. It will be the same thing over and over and over and over. And that's part of the maturation process so that you'll learn his voice. But then once you know his voice, then he begins to change his methods on how he speaks. Okay? One time, it feels like a thought. Something comes to me. Another time, it'll be a dream. I'll see something. It'll be a vision. Or I, it'll, something will come up off, off the word of God to me. Or, and I've had this happen, I've been praying in the Spirit, and my tongues turns into an English unction, and it wasn't me speaking, it was God speaking it through me. And that became a word to me. Do you all understand what I'm saying? And that's the point I'm trying to make. You've got to learn how he's choosing to speak to you so you don't confuse it, okay? This is how you build value. Learn to recognize it. Learn to recognize it. So let's recap real quick. Train yourself to listen. Do not wait for emergency situations. Seek to hear from him every single day. Make his voice a priority in your life and learn to recognize how God is speaking to you. Jillian even said, she said to me, not that long, she goes, Dad, I think it's wonderful, I think it's great that God talks to you like that. She goes, God don't say nothing to me. And I said, he's, I said, he's talking to you, you just don't recognize his voice. Three days later, driving in the car, she goes, Dad, you know what I love about, about music, especially worship music? I said, what? She goes, that's what God uses to talk to me. Hello? I mean, it's your teenager for you, Right? But that's the reality. Sometimes, and we talked about this last week, about God speaking through lyrics. God will do that for you, right? Learn, look for it, seek it. Say, God, speak to me. Speak to me. Amen? Amen. All right, let's do this before uh, we wrap up here. I want to give you four things, four things how you can build honor to the voice of God. Four ways you can build honor to the voice of God. So how can we give honor to his voice? Number one, okay? Now, don't change the channel. Don't get up and leave. Listen carefully. Number one, set an appointment with God. Set an appointment with God. I don't want you to think of this, that I'm penciling him into my day. But think of setting a, when you set an appointment, that appointment then becomes what to you? A priority, it becomes important, right? Right, that's why, that's why you set an appointment with a doctor because you want to make sure you don't miss the meeting with the doctor. That's why you set an appointment with a lawyer because it's important to you. So you set the meeting with the lawyer, right? Set an appointment with God because this is how you can train yourself to hear him by saying, when I'm in this place, when it's this time, it is me and God and nobody else, and this is my time. Set an appointment. If something's important, you make, a prior, you make it a priority. God comes, write this down. God comes to prepared people in prepared atmospheres. God comes to prepared people in prepared atmospheres, and setting an appointment is you preparing the atmosphere to hear him. Do not allow interruptions. And I know for some of you that's almost impossible. But you have to find that place. You've got to find that space. Okay? If you've got small ones, man, they're going to test this. But you, you can make it work. Because it, it might, especially if you're married, it might be that your appointment time with God is not the same as your spouse's and you're, you're making sure there are no interruptions. Make sure. And if you can't do this at home, go find yourself a place where you can do this. Set an appointment with God. Don't allow interruptions. And understand that this is when your time belongs to the Lord. Your time doesn't belong to anybody else. Your time doesn't belong to social media. It doesn't belong to your job. It doesn't belong to your spouse. It doesn't belong to your children. It doesn't belong to your pet. Your time belongs to the Lord in this appointment. 
You understand what I'm saying? Sometimes when I have my appointment with the Lord, I say, okay, God, this is it. I'm not leaving this seat until you tell me. Until I hear your voice, I'm not moving. And you know what? Sometimes it's within five minutes God speaks. Other times, it's hours. And God will say, okay. He actually told me one time. He goes, I just want to see if you'd wait it out. And I'm like, ha ha, I did. And then he said to me, well, what would you have done? How long would you have sat? I said, that's not important. That's not, we don't have to talk about that, Lord, right? Set an appointment. Set an, your appointment, okay, let's give you some practical application here. Your appointment might be <coughs> your drive into work. It might be going to a park and sitting there in his creation <coughs> and not moving until he speaks. Maybe it's a walk. Some of you are like, well, Lord, you better speak. My legs are giving out. Like, I need to hear you now. But that's it. <clears throat> Set an appointment. <clears throat> the other part about that is it, your appointment needs to happen in a designated time, in a designated place. This is not so that God will know he can talk to you. It's so that you will know this is the, this is the time <clears throat> for me to hear God. Right here, right now. Amen? Number two. Number one is set an appointment with God. Number two, be still and worship. Be still and worship. Why is this important? Okay, so this is not, this is not the Judamar expression. Right? So this is not you bouncing around like your tigger. Okay, so this is not boisterous. This is not running. This is not jumping and dancing. This is you settling your soul. Uh, it doesn't have to be quiet, but it will quiet your soul. It is you getting into the presence of God. This is where you cast all of your cares on him. Uh, let me say it this way. The Bible says cast all your cares. This, hey, unload. Unload, because you can't hear God if you're burdened down. You cannot. You cannot hear God if you're worried. You cannot hear God if you have anxiety. You can't. You've got to unload on him. And sometimes your unloading on him is going to come with tears. Sometimes your unloading on him is going to come with anger. If you don't believe me, read the book of Psalms. David Sometimes your unloading on God comes in the form of a complaint. How much did David do that? Lord, look at everybody surrounding me. But you are my shield, right? Unload on God. This is casting your cares on him because what, it, what it's doing is it's making, the G, it's making Jesus the center of the equation and it's not making you the center. So you've got to unload all the junk that's in your life and get into his presence and man, just unload it. And in that moment, exalt him, lift him up, magnify him. This is how you build value. Not only do I have a set time with God, but I'm unloading on God. I'm getting rid of all of the burdens I'm carrying because I cannot carry my own burden and hear God at the same time. I can't do it, okay? Number three, Number one, set an appointment. Number two, worship. Be still and worship. And then number three, pray and read the word. Pray and read the word. When I talk about pray, listen, there's no formulas. Just talk to him. Like what would you do? What would you do right now if tomorrow morning you're sitting at your kitchen table drinking your coffee or tea or whatever it is that you drink in the morning and you looked across the table and Jesus Christ sat there just looking at you. Just saying, hey, what's up? Would you go into, oh, no, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get all churchy. You wouldn't be like, yea, I would say unto thee, my God. No. 
First of all, when you realize Jesus is at your table, you've been slapping yourself like, oh, dear God, and I'm seeing visions, like what's going on, right? You'd weep, right? Most of us probably be like, I need a hug, right? You know, like, like, Jesus, if that's you, I want to feel your arms wrapped around me, right? But, in that, but then if he said, hey, talk to me, talk to me. Like, like how wild would that be? Jesus walks into your kitchen and says, you want some more coffee? Stop it. Do you want some? Right? What if he says, hey, let's have a cup of coffee together and let's talk? Because that's what prayer is. It's just talking to God. You don't have to have all his titles memorized. Remember, we went through the names of God. You ain't got to list them all. You can just go to him and say, this is what's on my heart. That's what he wants to hear. Whatever is on your heart, whatever is weighing heavy. Because I'm going to tell you something. If you're making this appointment on the daily, what's on your heart is going to change every single day. Maybe one day it's the condition of the nation. Maybe another day it's your health. Maybe another day it's your finances. Maybe another day it's your church. Maybe another day it's your pastor. Whatever's on your heart and you just talk to him about it. And as you search the scriptures, he will make the Bible come alive to you. But when you're praying in these moments, in these encounters, here's the thing. Don't hold back. Don't reserve something. Let, let, it, let it fly. Say, God, this is what's on my heart. Because guess what? The reality is he already knows. But he wants to hear it. He wants to hear you say, this is what's on my heart. And if you'll do this, this is a part of honoring his voice, building value in his voice. I'm set the time. I'm getting into his presence. I'm worshiping him. I'm sharing with him my burdens, my cares, my concerns, what's on my heart the things that weigh heavy on my mind, and yet he hasn't even opened his mouth yet, but I'm now in the moment where I can hear him. Because by worshiping him and by praying, I'm unloading all my baggage. I'm giving it everything to him. And I'm saying it's all yours. It's all yours. It's all yours. And then he can speak. Number four, Listen and write. In your appointment with God, I highly encourage you to have two things, a Bible and a journal. Have a Bible. And now some of you are like, now, Pastor Tim, come on now. You know, I'm not, I'm not really that type of person. Do you want to value his voice or not? I'm, I was in Bible college, and God spoke to me. And, and he said, I was, in, I was in the bed, and he said, uh, he said look to your left. And I'll throw to my left, and I had a little nightstand there. He said, what's there? Again, these are my conversations with the Lord. I said, you know what's there. He's like, tell me what's there. I said, you're omniscient. This is me arguing with God as a 19-year-old kid. He said, I said, tell me what's there. So I looked over, and I said, well... I got something to drink, and I have my alarm clock. He said, what else is there? I said, nothing. And he said, and that's the problem. I said, what? He said, from now on, you'll keep a pad of paper and a pencil by your bed. I said, but why? Right? Like typical teenager, right? Like you have to help me understand this, Lord. I said, why should I do that? He said, because you don't know when I'm going to tell you something you're going to want to remember. So, like that next day, I went to the store, got me like, like notebook after notebook after notebook after notebook, and then I learned from my father to not leave a pen or a pencil, but to leave multiples there. Because just as soon as God starts talking, your writing utensil won't work. And so I remember one time I had one there, and God spoke to me, and I went to write, and I mean, not, not in not an ounce of ink. And then I was running throughout my apartment trying to find a pen. Couldn't find a pen nowhere. I'm a single guy, you know. I didn't have a surplus of pens. So I went to the store that day, and I bought, like, the bulk box of pens. I said, this has never happened to me again. You know, my father always said anytime he was getting a word from God, he would have a, a notebook and three pens. 
just in case two ran out, he'd have one. And so let me encourage you to do that. So what am I going to write down? I'm going to listen for his voice, and then I'm going to write down what I hear. Now watch this. You might not even know that it's God. I'm going to write down three things. My thoughts. Number two, my prayers. And number three, simple words or phrases. I'm going to tell you all testimony because my wife's not here. And I can't get in trouble. And ne'er one of y'all better tell her. She said to me the other day, she's like, I was, she goes, I was in church. I said, uh-huh. She goes, and I had my eyes closed, and I saw somebody. I said, uh-huh. And she said, and it was like a single word came to me. I said, what'd you do with it? She said, I said, oh, Kimberly, stop it. You're making this up. I said, really? I said, what happened? She said, the next thing I knew, they were in the altar. And I said, what happened then? She said, I said, fine. Fine, God, I'll tell them. She said, but I only had a word. I said, what'd you do? She said, I told them what the word was. She's like, and as soon as the word got out my mouth, it started flowing out of me faster than I could talk. And I said, this is our marriage. I said, it's as if your husband knew what he was talking about when he taught on the gifts of the Spirit. She's like, I'm doing the laundry. And she walked out. Can you believe that? How rude. She walked away from me. No, she came back in the room. She goes, I know, I know. So, and I'm, I'm telling you that story for two reasons. One, she's not here. And two, most importantly, I want you to see you're not the only one in this church where it's a struggle to recognize whether it's you or God. So by journaling, by writing down as I'm meeting with God, I'm learning the difference between my thoughts and God's words. Okay? You need to see that. And that's how you grow. That's how you cultivate this. I can tell you right now, if I sat down, if I sat down on that seat on a Sunday morning and I hear something in my spirit, I know if it's Tim or God immediately. Why? I didn't start doing this six months ago. I've been hearing God since I was 13 years old, and I know his voice. You might be brand new. Give yourself some grace, but learn it. Write it down. Because what God sees when you say, here's my Bible, here's my notebook, this is my time with you, Lord, God sees they're serious about hearing my voice. They're valuing my voice. They're honoring my voice. And do you think for one minute God is then going to sit back and say, well, I refuse to talk to them? No. He's going to talk to you. But it might feel like a thought. It might feel just like a fleeting moment. Write it down. Write it down. It might feel silly to you. You might write it down and say, well, I, I just can't see where that's God. Chances are it was. But because it's new to you, you might not recognize it. Write it down. What do I do after I write it down? This is your next step. Write down what you hear. Number three, read it, reread it, and then read it again. Over and over and over and over and over and over and over. By doing so, I am now praying over what I've written. If it's God, it will come to pass. If it's you, it will dissipate. I'm going to say that again. If what you've written is God, it will come to pass. If what you've written is you, your own thoughts, your own ideas, your own ideals, it will vanish. It will absolutely vanish, right? I was in my office one day in Ohio, and I just had the thought, Lord, wouldn't it be something if you sent me to Hawaii? And I wrote it down. I sat in my office one day, and I, and I read it and read it. And then, and then God said, you sure that was me? No. And I ripped it up and threw it away. And God said, I have something for you to do. Hawaii ain't it. Right? Now, I know some folks might say, hey, I'll be your interpreter, Pastor Tim. Let's learn the language. Let's go. 
right? But that's the thing. That clearly was me. I can tell you right now, God is my witness. And some of you won't believe this, and that's fine. It's my job to tell you what God said, and then you can do with it whatever you want. I was in my office, and God said, get a piece of paper. I grabbed the piece of paper. And then God said to me, he said, if it's true that I'll give you the desires of your heart if you delight in me, he said, what is it you're expecting to receive? I said, come again. He said, what is it that you want? And I said, God, I'm like, no. And then the scripture came up, and Jesus said to the blind man, what will you have me do for you? Even though he could see he was blind, he still asked him what he wanted. And God said, what is it that you want? So I started to write some stuff down that was in my heart. And then God said, now don't worry about the list. Delight in me and watch me do it. That list is in my drawer, and I haven't touched it since. On that list, on that list is the description of the house we just closed on today. And I, I, need, I need to show you this, though. Not everything I'm telling, not all the things that come up in you are going to be spiritual. And you will dismiss them if you don't perceive them as being from God. God, does, God cannot be pigeonholed into one category. When, if something comes up in you, watch God do it. Watch God do it. Well, can I tell you something? A few months ago, I was driving into Fulton, and God said to me, he said, what about that list? I said, what about that list? And he said, you wrote it, but you tucked it away. I said, right. I said, I'm not worried about that list. And he said, why don't you start praying for the fulfillment of that list? I said, all right. So that's all. And I still haven't pulled the list out. And then when we got through this process, I was sitting there thinking, God, how did you, how did you do this? And you know what he said to me? Remember the list? And it hit me. If I would delight in him, He'll do the results. I didn't have to do anything to bring this to pass. God did it. God did it. So then I signed the papers today, and I saw the schedule of the payments today, and I said, Lord, you're going to have to do it again. <laughs> huh? And that's what he said to me. He said, I didn't bring you this far to let you fail now. That's what God said to me. That was a word of God to me. Amen. And I believe God will just do it. So I want you to write this down in your notes. Lord, if you've spoken this, then I receive this into my life. I'm going to say it again. Lord, if you have spoken this, then I receive this into my life. When you are journaling, you need to write those things down because this is what's going to happen. If you will pray that prayer, Lord, if you've spoken this, then I receive this into my life. The things that you wrote down that were from God will be fulfilled. The things you've written that were not from God will vanish and disappear. I'm going to say that again. Lord, if you've spoken this, then I receive this into my life. Lord, if you've spoken this, I've received this into my life. So I was praying the other day, and I said, Lord, this was on my list. I was in my office, and I began to describe a house I was believing you for, and you've done it. And I said, I just want to say thank you. You know what he said to me? What about the rest? What did I tell you? God is more eager to answer than you are to ask. He said, what about the rest? Lord, if you've spoken this, I receive this into my life. And can I tell you some of this stuff that was in my heart that day, we've already, we've already begun to see it. Miracles in this house, revival breaking out in this house, people hungry for the Lord in this house. And God, I got a message today. Somebody that hasn't been to church in months 
You know when you know when they stopped attending? When it started to look like a crime scene around here. And they got scared. And I got a message today, right in the middle of the day, and it said, just want you to know 